Okay, hello everyone. I'm going to talk about uh, income inequality, and I will do a comparison using both the sociology and the behavioral economic perspectives. Uh, my name is Marius. I'm a business major at the Norwegian School of Economics. So just a quick executive summary. Uh, we see that income inequality is rising in the world, uh, especially between the richest and the poorest. And it's a fact that uh, women earn less than men. Uh, I'm going to try to explain this using both behavioral economics and sociology, as mentioned. And uh, we see that both economic, uh, economic theory and sociology together can explain the different causes for income inequality, as uh, well as come up with some potential solutions. Uh, so we see that some of the causes are both uh, society through structural barriers, as well as individual decision making. Uh, and while the theorists can uh, explain some of the different uh, causes and come up with some solutions, there are no correct answer to what needs to be done. So let's take a deep uh, dive into this. So just a situational overview. Uh, we see that top 1% of earners capture 21% of all income in the United States. And then the Gini co uh, coefficient, which is uh, explaining inco income inequality, uh, has increased in the United States. Uh, looking at the world picture, uh, the top 76% of the world's wealth is held by the top 10%. And also 9.2% of the world's population uh, live below the world, world Bank's poverty line. Uh, and the current gender wage gap uh, is averaging at the 17% worldwide. So I'm just doing a comparison between the two theories, uh, or the fields of theory that I'm going to use. Uh, we have behavioral economics on one side, which is more focused uh, on individuals. Uh, and they're trying to predict behavior, uh, often using experimental economics. Uh, sociology, on the other hand, uh, are more focused on societal factors and are trying to explain existing behavior, uh, often looking at historical perspectives. Uh, together, they are both interdisciplinary approaches as they uh, rely on uh, other aspects like uh, policies and uh, uh, psychology as well. Uh, and they're quite comprehensive theories. So there's uh, yeah, a lot of different uh, sub-theories within the fields. So looking at uh, behavioral economics first, uh, I'm going to go through four different uh, sub-theories within the field. Uh, we have bounded rationality, which means that individuals have limited cognitive abilities and rely on heuristics. Uh, if everyone, everyone, anyone has read Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, it's a good exp uh, explanation of this. Also, we have uh, prospect theory, uh, meaning that individuals evaluate potential gains and losses rel relative to our reference points. Uh, and this is, uh, has caused the loss aversion, meaning that uh, individuals, individuals are more sensitive to losses than they are to gains. Uh, the third one is time inconsistency and the present bias, uh, which is that future rewards are discounted more heavily than present ones. Uh, and this leads to individuals making more short-term decisions than uh, long-term. Finally, we have social preferences, uh, which is that individuals are influenced by social norms, uh, such as fairness uh, considerations. Uh, and this is contradiction of the classical theory of homo economicus, meaning they're a rational human being. So trying to apply uh, behavioral economics uh, and explain income equality, uh, we see that uh, suboptimal choices are being made due to bound rationality. Uh, since individuals rely on heuristics uh, when, for example, choosing educational institutions uh, rather than considering specific programs, they might not choose uh, what's best for them. Uh, such heuristics can be, for example, what uh, their parents have done earlier. Uh, and we see that first generation college students often struggle with navigation, navigating the college application process due to a lack of familiarity and guidance. Also, we have present bias and the savings. Uh, and we see that individuals with present bias may struggle to save for long-term goals uh, compared to those who are better at uh, uh, managing their investment decisions. And this will also uh, uh, impact future income. And um, present bias is uh, stronger in low-income households. Uh, also, we can take a look at loss aversion and how it affects uh, job uh, offers and salaries. Uh, we can see that workers may be reluctant to accept job offers uh, with low initial salaries, even if the job offers uh, are better for long-term uh, career advancement and income growth. Uh, also, uh, women are more likely to have uh, a higher degree of loss aversion than men, uh, and this can uh, lead to them being uh, more averse to negotiating salaries as they can perceive the potential downside of the negotiation as a loss. Uh, and this can explain some parts of the gender wage gap. So moving on to sociology, uh, we have social uh, stratification, uh, which is that society is organized into different social classes. Uh, and this leads to individuals having unequal access to resources. Furthermore, we have discrimination, which creates uh, structural barriers, uh, such as unequal pay, hiring bias, and uh, workplace harassment. Also, we have institutional arrangements, such as labor market policies, uh, tax systems, and social safety nets, 
uh, which is both the shape resource distribution and the opportunities. Uh, and so cultural factors are uh, values, beliefs, and norms. Uh, they shape expectations and attitudes, attitudes towards wealth and success. So trying to apply sociology, uh, we see that uh, discrimination affects income, especially since the racial minorities and uh, women are more likely to face discriminatory barriers in the labor, ma labor markets. Uh, and using US as an example, we see that uh, women here are paid less than men, even when accounting for factors such as education and experience. Uh, institutional arrangements often create uh, incentives for some uh, and barriers for others. Uh, such arrangements can be different tax systems and labor market policies. And this can affect the uh, income equality as well. Uh, also, social stratification and inequality. We see that the different social classes have unequal access uh, to resources. Uh, and then uh, an example of this is that children from low-income families uh, have fewer educational and career opportunities than those from higher-income families. And also, some cultures are more likely to legitimize unequal opportunities than others. Uh, using US as an example, once again, we have, for example, here the American Dream, uh, which can lead to people overlooking the structural barriers in place uh, and only focusing on individuals. So are there any solutions? What can be done? Uh, looking at behavioral economics first, uh, transparency is one potential solution, uh, since individuals then will become more aware of disparities. Uh, and this leads to also employers uh, being pressured to uh, ensure fair compensation. Uh, also nudge will prevent the individuals from making bad decisions, uh, since they will be less affected by time inconsistency and uh, present bias as well. Uh, thirdly, we have invest in education. This will equip individuals with the abilities to access better paying jobs and opportunities uh, and reduce the impact of structural barriers and prevent the bounded rationality. Uh, sociology uh, means uh, some solutions that are policies uh, that can protect labor can be put in place. Uh, for example, minimum wage laws and labor unions uh, can counteract the oppressing market forces that leads to income inequality. Also, a redistribution of uh, resources can be uh, helpful, uh, such as uh, through maybe progressive taxation. Uh, then high income earners will provide for low income individuals. Uh, finally, we have safety nets, uh, such as unemployment benefits and uh, health care. Uh, these will promote uh, social mobility and reduce the consequences of income inequality. So what needs to be done? Uh, of course, income equality affects uh, a lot of different fields, such as uh, economy, the social justice, and innovation and growth. And there are arguments for uh, both uh, reducing the income equality and uh, for less intervention. Uh, some arguments for that uh, not m too much to be done is that uh, minimal interference allows for more growth, as uh, market interference will reduce the incentives for innovation, and that the income inequality is actually a good thing, as it uh, provides opportunities for uh, growth. Also, uh, some arguments is that uh, income inequality is a natural outcome of individual efforts, talent, and risk taking. Uh, on the other hand, some other arguments for uh, more intervention is that uh, excessive income inequality leads to reduced social mobility uh, and diminished and social cohesion. Uh, and also that government intervention is necessary to address market failures and also to promote fairness. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, we see that income inequality is uh, an existing uh, thing in the world and it's rising between the richest and the poorest. Uh, women earn less than men, and we can try to explain this using both behavioral uh, economics and sociology. Uh, and we see that there are both individual decision making and structural barriers in place that uh, is causing the income inequality in the world. And uh, while there are some different uh, potential solutions to what needs to be done, there is no correct answer since individuals have uh, differing opinions to whether income inequality is a bad thing or a good thing and what needs to be done. So that's all I had. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Such a huge and complex literature across both, you know, two big um, social science fields. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about how you narrowed down. How did you decide what you're going to read? How did you narrow that down and decide what was important and what wasn't um, as you were doing this research? Because I'm just picturing the shelves and shelves and shelves and yeah. shelves of books in the library about about this. So I'm wondering if you could just comment on that a bit. A bit. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, and as a business student at the Enemy School of Economics, I wanted to find uh, a theme that's both within economy and uh, sociology. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of different economic uh, theories. 
Uh, as I mentioned, we have like the classical ones with the uh, Homo economicus, and uh, which is quite different from uh, uh, the behavioral economics. Uh, so what I tried to do was finding theories that uh, uh, are correlating to what's actually happening in the society. As uh, so we see that behavioral economics are better at explaining, for example, uh, the existing income inequality than uh, classical economic theories are. Uh, and also I try to focus, uh, of course, income inequality is diff uh, different in a lot of parts in the world. So I try to focus uh, in my paper, I focus mostly on the US uh, as well as uh, some global aspects of it. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of theories. So I read through a lot and uh, yeah, I try to find the most important sub theories that uh, can be useful to explain income inequality. But of course, we have, as mentioned, uh, for example, uh, sociology, no, uh, psychology as well, which uh, can explain all the parts of it. and. Uh, yeah, some of the different explanations there, they're not really weighted uh, up against each other. So some might be better at explaining or have like a larger impact to income quality than others. Uh, so that's something that I haven't been able to look into yet. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you're talking about mastering all of the social sciences. <laughs> um, another question is, what do you see as some of the bigger differences between the two perspectives that you did focus on in terms of thinking about like, do they agree that it's a problem, that there's too much income inequality? And at what point is there too much? Because there is the view that, well, we need to have inequality to drive innovation and that kind of thing. Um, and, and then also, the, there's the question of politics. Yeah. Through that, that's just, I yeah, mean, so these things don't exist, like, abstractly. So, um, and any kind of solution. Yeah, so politics affects mm -hmm. a lot of this. And uh, the theories don't really have like uh, a baseline for what is good, a good amount of income inequality and what the, what isn't. And uh, we can also see that uh, in different countries, for example, in the, the US, there's a lot more income inequality than, for example, in uh, Norway, where I come from. Yes. Uh, so that's a good exp uh, example of that as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and the difference uh, between uh, behavioral economics and uh, sociology is that uh, behavioral economics focus more on individuals. Uh, they don't really see the amount of um, maybe structural barriers in place uh, in society, but uh, sociology focuses more on the uh, all aspects of it, like uh, the structural barriers as mentioned, and uh, more how individuals uh, work as a group instead of yeah, just as single persons, and how uh, yeah group culture can affect income quality as well. Uh, but not they're not really differing too much. They have a lot of the same views, uh, just uh, different ways to explain it. Uh, but if you use the uh, the theories together, they have uh, mostly the same, uh, yeah, same solutions. Any other questions? They also seem similar um, that neither really considers people's own experiences of this. Like, how how are the how do people actually experience some inequality? And that may not have a place uh, at your level of analysis, but. I just think that's something else that seems to be similar. You mentioned psychology, um, social psychology yeah. can be relevant there. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think also the cultural aspects of it uh, is important uh, because I mentioned the American dream uh, leads mm -hmm. to some people in, uh, here in the US thinking that income equality is a good thing and it's uh, yeah, just a personal matter if you're rich or not, that uh, you have to work harder if you haven't been able to yeah, put your resources to work. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it, of course, it depends a lot of uh, the individuals how they perceive income equality. Of course, you, if you're on the higher end of it, you're going to think it's a good thing, most likely. Uh, of course, mm, poor ones uh, maybe actually uh, yeah, face a lot of the structural barriers that uh, I really see that they are in place and therefore think that uh, income equality is an unfair thing and that it needs to be changed. So it depends on the individuals, I guess. And then there is surprising um, negative cases, uh, outliers that buck those two um, trends. I, you know, I agree that those are trends. Um, rich people tend to think it's a good thing and vice versa. But does that always happen? I mean, the power of ideology is fascinating in that sense. You know, but anyways, um, yeah, we can maybe dig into that a little bit more um, yeah. beyond the kind of behavioralism, because I know these are two very different you know, disciplines or perspectives, but it's interesting to see that they, at least the way you've presented them, have that in common in the sense that like talking about um, disparity, inequality, but like what what do people, um, 
yeah, I guess it's just a different level of analysis than what you're looking at. I always try to bring that in whenever I can. Yeah, <laughs> I see Tristy Filo. The more phenomenological, I guess you call it. Um, anybody else? So I wanted to say thank you for a wonderful presentation. And it's a lot of complex information that I feel is very well organized and presented in a very clear format. And related to the design of your actual presentation, I thought you could share just a little bit about your process with taking all the information, organizing it, and if there was a template that you pulled this from or if you created this your, yourself. For the presentation, like the PowerPoint itself? Yes. Uh, yeah, so I had like a template I used uh, from the Energy School of Economics. Uh, we are like a case competition team uh, at the school. Uh, so they have a lot of different templates that they use for competitions. Uh, so a lot of design I just took from there and like used it to create my own presentation. Uh, and when it comes to the information itself, uh, I tried to focus more first on like the different aspects of sociology and different aspects of behavioral economics that uh, I thought that was, could be relevant to explain income inequality. And then I tried to apply it and uh, find different readings on uh, yeah, how, they, how the theories could explain income inequality. So that's how I structured my presentation and that's also how I structured my paper. Excellent, thank you for sharing. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.